for some of you that may not know me. I thank Russell for him putting his trust in me and putting me in this position on a couple of occasions. See, I was a pastor for 25 years in Georgia. I didn't give up my pulpit readily. Nor does Russell. And so I thank him for trusting me with this. And uh, I guess the elders just went along with it. I didn't know what he had up here. Okay. I have yet to uh, get to a place to use this. Maybe if I spoke more often, I would. We've been here about four years, isn't that right? So some of you know me and some don't. Um, I bring the subject to you that we don't very seldom talk about. Oh, we sing about it. We allude to it. We even sang about it this morning. But it's a subject that God's put on my heart. And I'm going to say some things that I don't have time to really establish or teach you deeply in. You're just going to have to trust me, but if you've got any questions about it, see me later. We'll talk about it. See, as Christians, we're looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an exciting thing for us. All of us as Christians, we, we live with the anticipation of Christ's coming. What theologian Oscar Coleman said, the Christian exists in the tension between what is already and what is not yet. We've already experienced salvation, but we've not really experienced full salvation. Our bodies have not been changed. We've already received the power of the Holy Spirit, but yet we haven't experienced the fullness of the power of the Spirit and what He's going to do through us. We've already received life eternal, but we have not yet fully lived and participated in the full resurrection. That is, my body hasn't changed. I'm not in real eternal life yet, though I had that promise. And so we live caught between the already and the not yet in this tension of looking back at the cross and looking forward to the second coming. Now, I'm not going to set any times. <laughs> not going to set any dates. Not going to set any hours. But I bring to you the idea that God is going to be doing something very soon in our lives. I feel it. Matter of fact, from the time I was born, at least to have some idea of once I became a Christian at 10 years old, I was born in 1948. Anybody know what the significance of 1948 is? Establishment of Israel. Ever since I learned this, I felt I would never see death. Just had that sense. Now, if God takes me home, you know that I missed it. <laughs> but I always felt, really felt, that I would not see physical death, that I would be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Even to the point that in 1967, you know what the significance of that day? The Jews took over Jerusalem. You realize that in 40 years, to 2017, it's a generation of that time. Though we're living in the last days, we're not living in the last of the last days. Every believer I think lives with the idea Christ is coming. The first church looked for it. But we read in 2 Peter, the third chapter, 
39th verse, or excuse me, third chapter, verses 3 through 9. We're warned by Peter that mockers will come in the last days. They'll come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, where is this promise of second coming? For ever since the fathers have fallen asleep, all continues just as it was from the very beginning of creation. Now you may have had that feeling sometimes. I mean, I've lived in a Christian home most all my life. My dad was a pastor. I've heard about the second coming of the Lord for all these years. And it's very easy to have the attitude, well, where is the second coming? And you may have wrestled that with yourself. But I want to say, it's coming. And we should live in that anticipation of it. You see, the problem with the mockers is they forget that there was a great flood. All things didn't, as it, as it always did. There was a great flood in Noah's day. Verse 7 says, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly man. You see, God has a plan for this world that we live in. And he has also thankfully given us the view of what's coming, of the new heaven and the new earth that we'll be in. But our understanding of God's Word is extremely, extremely important. I want you to note something with me. The understanding of the apostles and the Jewish leaders of Christ's time in His first coming. You know, they had all the prophecies. Everything was laid out accurately. It could very easily be understood. I mean, you can't read Isaiah and not see the picture of the crucifixion of Christ. You can't read Jeremiah and not see the Savior. The point being is they had all the information they needed very accurately given, very easily understood. But look what happened. Even to the ones that followed him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, when he began to talk about the fact of what his life was really to be in his first coming, that is the sacrificial lamb for our sins, Peter said, oh no, hey, now get it straight beside you, you're not going to die. What well, was Jesus' response? Get behind me, say. You see, they didn't understand. They didn't understand the will of God in Christ's life. He was the Messiah. He was coming to set up the kingdom. Now. No. Not now. Yes. He is sometime. But not now. Not in their time. He wasn't going to die. He was supposed to be the king of Jerusalem. And even after he fed the thousands of people food, they even went toward him, forcing him, wanting to force him to become king. And he sent him away, and he sent the apostles away in the boat by themselves, and Christ went by himself alone. Why? That wasn't God's plan. For him to be king right then, the king of Jerusalem, yes. What did he do? But not then. Why was it that they were misunderstanding all this? The prophecies of Christ's coming was accurate and thorough. There were no mistakes. I believe with all of my heart that the prophecies of his second coming are just as accurate and just as clear and just as understandable. But you don't hear the teaching of it very much because people have made it hard to understand. You know, it's an amazing thing. You get man in the way and he'll confuse everything. <laughs> Don't you love that we have a pastor who proclaims that he believes every word of this book? Amen. 
who preaches and teaches deep things of God every time he speaks. We all probably should have left last Sunday fully convicted about dying to self. One of the best sermons I've ever heard. One of the best messages I ever heard regarding that. I thank God that Christ has helped us in doing all things. He died for us in all things. I can't die to myself. But I'm sure let the Holy Spirit help me die. We need to understand the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not the very hour, not the day, but we sure can understand the season. Christ even used the illustration in Matthew about the fig tree, Matthew the 24th chapter, 32nd verse, about the fig tree, how we can see the fig tree coming and blossoming. <coughs> and that, if we can understand what's happening in the season of that, we can understand as we see certain things happen. And Jesus gave those certain things. Don't have time to go through it all. But understand that it is something that we can understand and get straight. The importance of talking about this, this coming is that it builds hope. It also causes us to be thrilled. I've got to take a side step. I'm going to kid Tommy a little bit. He is one of the coolest guys I've ever seen. I mean, he just, he's there. But one Sunday he got up and he said, Oh, we are so thrilled to have you with us today. He didn't show he did that thrill. <laughs> but I know he's excited. But you know, we're almost like that to the world. They don't realize how excited we are about the second coming of Jesus. We kind of stopped talking about it and stopped showing it. But it's important that we start making it a priority to proclaim the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter, in the very first sermon from the day of Pentecost, mentioned it, quoting Joel, talked about the second coming. The very first gospel message given talked about the second coming of Jesus. But how many sermons have you heard about the second coming of Jesus? How many? Paul, writing to Thessalonica, the church there in Thessalonians, had to correct some of their misgivings about the second coming of the Lord, which means they were talking about it and they were expecting it. And they were getting confused with it. And so therefore in Thessalonians, if you look at it, it talks about those things. They were confused about what's going to happen to those that have fallen asleep or died before Christ came. In other words, if we're not talking about it, if we're not expressing the excitement of it, I don't believe we're doing all that we should do. I don't believe we're exposing the world, the non-believer, to the real fact of what's going to happen. First of all, I'm not talking about Christ coming as the next great event. You might have thought I meant that, but I didn't. The next great event is the gathering of the bride of Christ. The gathering of the bride of Christ, the true church, is going to be the next great event. And I don't believe it will be long. Matter of fact, there is nothing that I can find in Scripture that tells me that the great gathering of the bride of Christ couldn't happen right now. Before I get through speaking, it could happen. It 
In other words, the taking out of the bride of Christ out of this world has to happen before the great seven-year tribulation. And Christ himself comes from the bride. He doesn't send anybody for her. He comes in the air and he shouts with a trumpet sound the archangel calling the bride of Christ to him. And the bride of Christ will remain with him through the seven year tribulation in heaven. John says that in the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 3, that through the duration of the tribulation, the bride will be with Christ. In Revelation 3, 8 through 10, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Because you've kept the word of my preservation, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Turn with me to Thessalonians. In that letter that we alluded to earlier, Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, and the thirteenth through the eighteenth verse. But we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are falling asleep that you will not be grieved as to the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Well, this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. But the Lord himself will descend from heaven, and with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Our soul shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Hey, I'm not going to be here forever. And I don't have to face the tribulation. Turn with me to Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, First Thessalonians 5. I should read all of verses 1 to 11. That would what I would want you to read is if you read verse verse. 1 to 11, but let me call your attention to only one verse. Verse 9. For God has not emphasized, not destined us for wrath. The great tribulation is God's wrath upon the earth, His judgment upon the earth. We're already judged through Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm so thankful for that, aren't you? Amen. We're not going to stand before the great white throne of judgment. That's another whole story I won't go into. We don't have to. We're already reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why I call him Father. That's why I can go to him and call him Abba. And so therefore I have no fear of what the future holds in regard to the great thing. You think that things are bad now? And they are. Well, with the hail storms that we've had, with the flooding, with the rumors of wars, people killing other people, Christians are being beheaded. This is picnic compared to what the great tribulations would have been. Picnic. It's almost a love story. If you compare it to what's going to happen in the tribulation. I could almost be swept away to another 
us off about it, but it or not. <laughs> Short, quick, let me give you just a quick outline of Revelation. The church is mentioned in verses one or in chapters one through three. The church is mentioned in chapter four, but only in heaven. That is somewhere between chapter three and chapter four. The bride of Christ is taken home to be with the bridegroom. Church is never mentioned in chapter six through nine. Now I'm going to tell you a shocking statement. The so-called church of today will still be around in the tribulation. You know, Jesus said, be two out in the field working, one will be taken and one will be left. There'll be two at home, one will be taken one will be left. There'll be people sitting in church, and some will be taken, some will be left. Because Jesus Christ said, among the weak there are what? Tears. I want to say something else that may be a little shocking too. That during the tribulation, there are going to be converts. There are going to be people who haven't quite given over their whole life to Christ. They will in the tribulation. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want to be one of them. I don't want to be one of them. So, therefore, the question is, Everything that I've taken time to this point to say is to ask this question and make three quick points. <coughs> if you believe with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you've given yourself over to Him, then you also believe that He's true to His Word when He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Where I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Amen. Have you ever known Jesus to lie? Never. Never. Ever known a prophecy about Christ to be wrong? Never. Never. He's coming again to get us. But what? How are you motivated? It's an astonishing thing to me when I read the scriptures and study the second coming and the millennial reign and all that's going to happen before we really do get the new heaven and the new earth. It's astonishing to me that when Christ comes to get the bride and we stay with him, possibly through the second year reign of seven year tribulation, which would be like um, a wedding. <laughs> The Jewish wedding lasted that long. So it would be just perfect setting. God's always doing that perfectly. I had a friend of mine say that if Jesus doesn't come back at this time, he's missed a great opportunity. <laughs> God never misses an opportunity because he is on his plan, not our plan. Jesus wasn't a victim. He was an obedient son. He went to the cross willingly. He gave up himself willingly. He's going to do things when the Father tells him to do it. But it's an amazing thing that I look at. That when Christ does come back, truly come back to this earth, and sets his foot on the Mount of Olives and splits it wide open, and defeats the Antichrist, and Satan, and for a thousand years puts them in a cage, puts them out. They don't have any more influence. And for a thousand years, this earth that we live on now, not the new one, this one, for a thousand years, he will reign in his righteousness. Everything will be like God wanted it to be for a thousand years. Now, I don't know 
about you. I have a hard time calculating that in my mind. It's really hard. Because many will think that during that time we'll live a thousand years. There'll be births. There'll be deaths. But during that time, Christ's righteousness, God's whole plan that he had from the very beginning will be set forth. The lion will lay down with the lamb. Things won't bother us. We'll, there'll be no murders. There'll be none of that for a thousand years. But then Satan and all his angels will be turned loose again. And at the end of the thousand years, would you believe it? There will be people who rebel against God. My God, how could that be? But there will be. And that's when Jesus, with the breath of his mouth, destroyed Satan and all his angels. This earth belts, as it said before, reserved for fire for the ungodly. And then we'll get to you have a butt <laughs> before then. What motivates you? Where are you motivated? We talk about the coming of Christ. What's that to do to us? What are we doing? Let me make a quick three points. First, it ought to prepare us. We ought to be prepared. Well, how do you prepare for something you don't know what's coming? Well, ladies, you don't have to worry about the right shoes to pack or the right outfit to, to wear. Men, you don't have to worry about how many outfits to take or if you're just going to take your swimming trunks and that's it. How do you prepare? How do you prepare for the coming of the gathering of the bride of Christ. On Hebrews 19, 10 through 25, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but encourage one another in all the more as we see the day approaching. Now some pastors use this to frighten the people into attending church on Sunday. I don't think that's really the case here. Really, I think what God is telling us here is that we need to be together with the body of Christ. The bride needs to be together. Preparing ourselves, working, understanding what our skills are, performing those skills now. Don't you understand that we are being prepared to be used in the millennial reign. Now, some of you that might have the misconception that we're going to float on a cloud and play the harp all the time and sing hallelujah, well, I think the attitude of hallelujah and all of it will be in our hearts and spirits. But we're going to be working. Dadgum, I want to get out of work. joke at our house. I'm trying to retire. I was going to retire in December, but I can't do it because George keeps coming up with projects. <laughs> so now it's June. Yesterday my car flunked out on me. Got to have a new valve job. Let's either pay for that or buy a new car. And guess what? Sid's retirement keeps being pushed. <laughs>
to do certain things. Now Christ said, I'm going to come like a thief in the night. Well, what do you do when you know that somebody's going to come into your house, a thief? Well, you set the alarm. You make sure all the windows and doors are locked. And you sit in your comfortable chair with your shotgun in your lap. <laughs> We prepare ourselves knowing that we're going to be working in the kingdom by doing and acting and being Christ now. By being Christ in the flesh now. Because we're going to be working in the kingdom. The second point, purify yourselves. Well, it's part of preparation, yes, but I think it's a point that should be taken maybe directly. Look with me in 1 John. First John, the third chapter. Verses 1 through 3. See how great a love God has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Don't you just love him? I remember when he was talking to his apostles and he said, you know, you once were slaves. But now I make you friends. Then he calls us children. We go from slave to sin, the slave to Christ, the friends with God, to being God's children. What a wonderful progression. And such as we are, for this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet, not appeared as yet as to what we will be. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him, what? Purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, if I were to tell you that Jesus is coming at noon today, if I, could give, if I could do that, how many of us would be on our face making sure that we have everything right? Yet that's the, what we're supposed to be living in. Purify yourself. Make sure that everything, everything, all our thoughts, all of our actions, all of our motivations, Everything comes from God. Because we're being prepared to be used to God. Turn to Titus. Turn with me to Titus. I can read where words at. Titus, the second chapter, verses 11 through 14. But the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, godly in this present time, or this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God, and say Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from the every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And then go to Peter, Second Peter, the third chapter, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and the heavens will pass away with a great roar of the elements. Destroyed with intense fire, and the earth and its works will all be burned up. Since all of these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, 
because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We're to be prepared. We're to be purified. And last, we are to proclaim. I'm trying to figure out how in the world I could illustrate this. But whatever thing that you ever got extremely excited about, probably you don't know how to say How many of you bought your first brand new car? Anybody bought their first brand new car? What did you want to do when you first got that brand new car? Besides take off and drive it. <laughs> Show off. Show off. Tell people that. This thing's got a beautiful engine. Three speed. No air conditioner because that time we didn't care. <laughs> we just wanted to go fast. <laughs> what I thought about my Barracuda 7, 1970. <laughs> if you have someone coming that you haven't seen in a long time, I was going to use other illustrations, but that's the best thing I can do. If, if you have somebody you truly loved, maybe in your family, they were coming, they were been gone, maybe they've been in service, maybe they're not overseas, and they were going to come a certain day. What do you do? I invite all my friends. I invite all my family. I'm going to get them all together because this person is special. Well, folks, Jesus Christ is special. And he's coming someday. Are you inviting people to him? And the fact that he's going to come like a thief, I don't think he's Think, but he's going to come like me. He's going to steal us right out of this world. Mm -hmm. Let me move to this. You see, I see this situation happening where Christ comes into the heavens and clouds and calls the bride to himself. The bride's red. She's clothed in white linen. She's clothed with the righteousness of Christ. She's bathed in the blood of the Savior. And the bridegroom comes and calls. I guess I should have used that as an illustration. What bride isn't so excited when the bridegroom comes, right? And the bride is taken out of the world. And I can see the headlines of the Antichrist the next day. Big, gigantic headlines. All the people that are causing problems are gone. <laughs> we got rid of them. And that will be his claim. I mean, the Lord hadn't told me that, but I think it is. But if it does, give me credit. <laughs> because we should be and are, I think in many cases, the only people that are standing up shouting against all the junk that's going on in our world. Amen. Amen. These United States were established on the Judeo-Christian ethics. Judeo-Christian ethics. I thought the last few elections were bad. <laughs> and I thought, man, what decisions we've got to make. But without making any political comments, for goodness sakes, what does God have in plan for us? <laughs> because God's the one who sets up kings and authorities. He's only got two choices, is what I'm saying. <laughs> and they ain't very good. But God's going to use whichever of those get into office to continue his plan. And the bride of Christ is going to be called out soon. Are you ready? Are you motivated? Yes. Learning your 
your skills, learning your place in the body of Christ, learning what you should be doing, purifying yourself, making sure that you are spotless through the blood of Jesus Christ and His righteousness? Are you ready by proclaiming the excitement about His coming? Are you excited? <laughs> oh, that's Tommy. That's okay. <laughs> Folks, with all my heart, I believe that Christ will come in my lifetime. Or the bride of Christ will be called out in my lifetime. I truly believe that. And with that, I pray that you'll get more excited. service with